You're trying to quickly send money to a friend for last night's dinner. So you open your banking app from one of the established banks that you're with and it's taking a little while. You tap through a few menus, maybe enter a passcode uh, twice and squint at an interface that's straight out of 2010. Meanwhile, your friend's already requested money through their Neobank app, which took her all of 10 seconds. Her phone buzzes with a cheerful notification and a cute emoji while you're still waiting for yours to load. Have you ever had that experience? Using a traditional banks app can feel like wading through mud sometimes, whereas a Neobanks app feels like just zipping along and like it's showing off. So, why do big banks often have such clunky mobile apps, especially compared to the slick fintech upstarts? Well, let's see what this funny business is all about. Here is the issue. Big traditional banks are hauling around decades of technological baggage. So to understand why their apps often frustrate us, we need to peek under the hood at their technology. Many long established banks are built on legacy infrastructure. Think of massive old computers called mainframes and the software that runs on them written in COBOL, which is a programming language from 1959. No joke. UK bank Barclays still today employs hundreds of mainframe engineers maintaining this COBOL code, a language that is over 60 years old. This stuff is literally older than the internet. It's as if the bank's digital foundation was built in the age of, well, rotary phones. And ever since then, it's just been patched up. These decades old core systems weren't designed for the instant always on demand of today's smartphone apps. They process things in big nightly batches and often don't nicely play with modern software. So no wonder a simple mobile transaction can feel like sending a carrier pigeon. The poor app is trying to talk to a backend that's from an entirely different era. In fact, nearly half of all banking systems globally still run on COBOL, which powers 95% of ATM transactions and 80% of in-person bank transactions. So yeah, when you withdraw cash from an ATM, the odds are that a 60-year-old code is allowing it to happen behind the scenes. It's reliable, but it's ancient. Now, imagine layer upon layer of updates and patches slapped onto that old core over the decades. Every new feature or product that the bank has introduced since the 80s, like online banking, mobile banking, remote deposits, wasn't built fresh from scratch. It's usually bolted on top of those archaic existing systems. Developers sometimes call this a spaghetti system because the code ends up tangled like a big bowl of pasta and each strand is a piece of software that overlaps and intermingles with others in fairly unpredictable ways. And banks often have thousands of these applications intertwined. So when you tap on something in the app, that request might effectively pass through a Rube Goldberg machine of old databases and services, each one written in a different era and in a different style. And the result of that is clunky performance and bugs. And so the IT teams at these massive banks are often terrified to update anything fundamental because one wrong tweak could break 10 other things. Now this accumulated complexity is what we call technical debt, which is basically the cost of cutting corners and postponing upgrades over the decades. Big banks have been building up technical debt for years. It's like they've been swiping the company credit card to pay for quick fixes and now the interest in the form of fragile convoluted systems is costing them. Maintenance of these old systems is exorbitantly expensive, yet replacing them is often like trying open heart surgery on a patient while running a marathon. It's incredibly risky. No wonder then that Bank of America reportedly spent around $10 billion in a year just to modernize its IT systems and JP Morgan spent $11.4 billion. Those eye-watering sums are just the price of unwinding decades of old code and infrastructure. So then the question is, why don't banks just get rid of this infrastructure and adapt the new technology that's available? Well, the reason is, it's because these legacy systems are so critical that banks are afraid to mess with them. You can't just turn off a bank's core system for a few days to do a full upgrade. Millions of customers would be cut off from their money, which of course would be unacceptable. Updates have to happen on live systems and often in small increments. And if something goes wrong, well, you know, the fallout will be huge. 
So for example, in 2012, the Royal Bank of Scotland pushed a seemingly routine software update that went horribly wrong. It crashed their payment system for days, freezing millions of customers out of their accounts. And then the RBS had to pay around $234 million in compensation just for this chaos. The cause? Well, investigations found that it was the bank's outdated and neglected IT infrastructure that was at fault. Essentially, their decades-old technical debt came back to bite them. RBS's CEO even admitted that the bank disregarded its technology for decades. And then, well, that disaster became a cautionary tale in the industry. Then more recently, at the start of 2025, Barclays, which is one of the UK's biggest banks, had a major outage that left customers unable to access accounts at around payday. And while Barclays was vague on the details, industry experts suspected that a failure in the core legacy platform caused the issue. They said banks like Barclays often rely on legacy systems comprising of decades-old code bases, and even a routine upgrade could trigger pretty severe failures. In other words, old code can break in spectacular ways. Now, these incidents make bank execs even more cautious. They start thinking, well, if we try to overhaul our system, could we cause a nationwide banking blackout? Maybe let's just keep patching things for now. It's the classic, if it ain't broke, do badly, don't fix it mentality. Unfortunately, that then leads to a vicious cycle, though. Avoiding big changes only piles up more technical debt for the future. It's a bit of a death spiral. And this is why you, dear user, end up with an app that often feels neglected. Because in some ways, it is. The bank's priority is keeping things stable, not necessarily pretty or cutting edge. They'll choose not to add a cool new feature if there is a risk that it might topple the house of cards that the whole thing is built on. Stability is pretty paramount when you're managing billions of dollars and often fairly strict regulations. So what about these neobanks then? Okay, let's flip to the other side. The neobanks and the fintech apps that seem to run circles around the big banks in terms of user experience. These are the digital-only upstarts. You've heard the names. Monzo, Revolut, Chime, etc. The crucial advantage that they have is that they're starting from a clean slate. If the big banks are the old mansion, neobanks got to build a brand new house. Energy-saving features, underfloor heating, heat pumps, and those cool central vacuum cleaner ports in every room. That's a true sign of wealth. They can install these from scratch without having to dig up the flooring and accidentally uncover the plague. Likewise, neobanks can design everything with modern tech from day one. No ancient mainframes to integrate and no COBOL lurking in the basement. Many of these new challenger banks are what's called cloud native by design. And that means that their core banking systems are built on the cloud and on platforms like AWS, Google Cloud, etc, etc, using modern programming languages and architectures. For example, Monzo, which is a popular UK neobank, runs on a microservices architecture, where over a thousand small services each do their own thing, like handling payments or sending notifications, and all of them communicate with each other very effectively and fast. And this microservice architecture is kind of like using, let's say, Lego blocks instead of building a big slab of software. It's much easier to update one small piece at a time without breaking everything else. On top of this, these digital banks practice what's called agile development methodologies, such as CI or CD, which stands for Continuous Integration and Continuous Deployment. Basically, what this means is that they update new code updates very frequently, sometimes even daily or hourly. It's the same approach that tech giants use to keep improving their apps. Fun fact, Amazon engineers deploy code every 11 seconds on average. Fairly impressive, but maybe not surprising for a company as big as Amazon. Similarly, fintech apps push out small updates and new features on a rolling basis. In contrast, a traditional bank might do a big app update maybe once a quarter or a few times a year because coordinating changes on legacy systems is slow and high stakes. So the Neobanks app is constantly evolving and improving, while the Big Banks app updates are, well, few and far between. Neobanks also started with a mobile-first mindset. They're essentially tech startups that also happen to do banking. So what they do is they emphasize sleek design and user-centric features as their core principles. Things like real-time spending notifications, instant freezing and unfreezing of your card in the app, budgeting tools and early access to paychecks were all pioneered by these fintech apps. 
On the other hand, traditional banks have been scrambling to copy these features, but it's tougher for them to implement due to, you guessed it, their legacy backend. For instance, if your core system only updates transactions once every night, you can't really easily show real-time spending alerts without major surgery to your systems. It's like trying to get an old pickup truck to perform like a Tesla. You can add the modern headlights and the fancy stereo, but at the end of the day, the powertrain is just not built for that kind of performance. Also, we need to look a little bit at the development culture. A fintech founded in 2015 will hire developers versed in the latest tech stacks and agile methodologies. They're not constrained by the way we've always done it. I'm sure you've heard that one before if you're at a big organization. A bank that's been around for a century has layers of management, risk committees, and lots of compliance checks. And that often means that even front-end design changes often have to go through lengthy approvals before they can be deployed. And the result here can be a design-by-committee feel in their apps versus the more experimental and user-tested approach at neobanks. Now, to be fair, and you might have noticed this, big banks are trying. Many have innovation labs or have bought fintech startups to revamp their image a little bit. Uh, some have even launched completely separate digital-only brands to start fresh. But integrating those innovations back into the main bank is still a pretty slow process. So what about reliability? You might assume that big conservative banks then have super reliable systems and the newer players might be a little bit flaky. Now, the truth here is that it's a bit mixed. Traditional banks' core systems, while old, are actually really extremely reliable at actually processing transactions. Banks trust them to handle millions of payments flawlessly each day. The failures tend to happen at the integration points or when updates go awry, as we saw with RBS or Barclays. But on the other hand, some early stage neobanks did also suffer outages and growing pains when scaling up. Monzo, for example, faced some outages in its early years as it stress tested its cloud infrastructure. The difference is, is that fintechs treat those incidents as learning opportunities and quickly shore up their weaknesses. And since they're not dealing with 30 year old code, the fixes are usually fairly straightforward. Now, legacy banks also have to manage an amalgamation of systems inherited from mergers and acquisitions. Imagine bank A buys bank B. Now they have to deal with two different core systems and often, Instead of fully merging them, they just connect them with APIs and call it a day. Do this a dozen times over, for decades, and you have a Frankenstein of systems in one company. A fairly recent example is that when UBS acquired Credit Suisse in 2023, it inherited a bunch of new legacy tech issues. In 2024, UBS then had some technology hiccups, and it was reported that the bank saw problems related to legacy systems that they had inherited from Credit Suisse. So mergers also create complexity monsters that fintech startups, well, they don't have to deal with at all. And all of this leads to the paradox. The banks with the most customers and money often move the slowest in user experience innovation. They're not trying to deliberately annoy you with clunky apps, they're just trapped by their own past success and age. Their first priority really is keeping your money safe and accessible, even if the app UI looks like a bit of a Windows XP program. Neobanks, on the other hand, being smaller and tech-driven, prioritize making their app experience delightful to attract users away from the big players, and it's working to an extent. In the US and the UK, significant chunks of new customers are choosing neobanks. In the US, nearly one in five new bank accounts is opened with a digital-only bank rather than a traditional bank. And in the UK, the top reason that people, and especially small business owners, switch away from high street banks is to get better mobile banking features. So the pressure is on at the old banks to step up their digital game. But as we've seen, it's not as easy as just a simple flip of a switch. So, to sum up, why do big banks have such bad apps? In short, they're anchored by legacy systems. These banks grew up in the analog age and adopted computers when they were first coming out in the 1960s to 80s. And then after that, bolted on things like internet banking in the 90s and mobile features in the 2000s, adding and rarely replacing. This created a convoluted tech stack that's costly and perilous to overhaul. Every new fintech style feature that you love has to be retrofitted into a system designed long before smartphones even existed, and even personal computers at that. It's like asking your grandpa to learn TikTok. 
It's possible, but the guy has to go through quite a lot of adjustments. Technical debt and complexity make progress slow and is fraught with risk. Banks will continue to patch and modernize in bits and pieces, but they can't just overhaul and wipe the slate clean overnight. A bank can't just halt its operations to reinvent its core. The migration has to be gradual and carefully managed, and that's a multi-year or multi-decade effort, and a multi-billion dollar one at that. Another reason why this isn't going away is organizational. Big banks are conservative by culture and by necessity. They have regulators watching them and they manage immense sums of money. And a lot of the times, all of their management will have a very old school mindset. Their culture is risk averse, but at the same time, tech is evolving at breakneck speed. By the time an old school bank finishes integrating one new system, five newer technologies have emerged. It's a bit of a cat and mouse game. Good news is that banks know that they have a problem, and they are investing heavily to modernize. You've probably actually seen some of the improvements over the years. Many big bank apps are slowly getting a facelift and are adding features like uh, mobile check deposits, better security in logins, and maybe even some spending insights as well. But those changes are very slow and incremental, and the bad news is that the fundamental constraints, which is their old core systems, mean that they'll always likely be a step or two behind the slickest fintech apps. So what can you do in the meantime? For one, try and manage your expectations. If you're with a traditional bank, don't expect the bleeding edge tech features or instantaneous everything. Maybe you might even learn to appreciate the strengths that your bank might have. Maybe something like a large ATM network or a variety of financial products and forgive their app for being a little boring. But if the app experience is a top priority for you, Consider doing what a lot of people do and use a hybrid approach. Keep your main account with that big old bank for stability, but maybe open a secondary account with a neobank for things like day-to-day -day spending. You can enjoy the cool budgeting tools and real-time notifications in the fintech app while keeping your larger savings or salary with the incumbent bank, which might offer things like better mortgage options or just the comfort of a brick-and-mortar branch when needed. Although I don't know about you, but all of those seem to be disappearing as well. Transferring money between them is easy enough and fairly instant. Essentially, you can get the best of both worlds, the innovation of the fintech and the legacy bank safety net. Also, people, don't underestimate the power of feedback. Banks do pay attention to app store ratings and customer complaints. If enough customers demand a feature, it does put pressure on the bank's product teams to prioritize it. And we're already seeing that with features pioneered by neobanks like uh, instant transaction alerts and easy bill splitting, eventually showing up at big bank apps due to their customer demand. It just takes more time. Thanks for making it to the end of the video, everybody. If you've got a story about a big banking app fail or a fintech experience that blew your mind, please leave a comment to let me know what it was. And of course, while you're there, please leave a like while you're at it. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm off to go do a COBOL for Dummies course so that I can become a millionaire in the future when I'm the last person who knows how to write it.